Lord, when we are afraid, we, we will trust in you. We will turn to the rock that is higher than I. You will become our refuge. Oh God, make me so. What time remains as we open the scriptures, Lord, we pray that you would take and use it to speak to our hearts. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, my rock and my redeemer. Lead us in this place. In Christ we pray. So it was the summer of 1975. I was nine years old. I had just finished, it was a Saturday night. It was in June sometime, although I don't remember the exact date. But I had just finished a Little League game, and we had traveled across the street to Regency Square Mall, where we had dinner, my family and I, at the Burger Chef. Anybody ever had dinner at Burger Chef? Not Burger King, Burger Chef. Yes, I don't think it exists anywhere. <laughs> I had four brothers, they were five of us boys, my mom and my dad, and we piled into our big honking yellow station wagon with brown panels on the side. And we started. The first car I actually got to drive when I was learning how to drive. The big chick wagon in those days. <laughs>
they're driving now, and a lot of times they stay out later than you want them to. Sometimes you sense that maybe they're drinking or maybe they're doing something else you're not quite sure. But there's just this increasing anxiety in your heart that you have now entered on the road, a very dangerous road where you can no longer control your kid. You're not sure exactly what to do. Should you become rigid and just never let them go out at all? Should you monitor in such a way that you choose who their friends are? We know this doesn't work. But you're afraid. You're afraid what's going to happen to your kid. You navigated those waters somewhat successfully because you made it to the place that you are, but you're not so sure that it's going to work for them. Or maybe you are recently divorced, or maybe you've never been married. And you look at your life and you think to yourself, I don't want to be alone for the rest of my life. And the more time passes, the more you realize that like, you don't have any realistic options in front of you. And you think to yourself, I don't want to forever be by myself. But it's a very real possibility. Fears, we have them, don't we? And some of them are very, very strong. The question I want to ask as we're getting started today is, what is it that we do when we're afraid? All of us are afraid from time to time. What is it that we do? What is our most initial response? How, does, how is it that we tend to react when something comes our way that frightens us? So I want us to think about that, get in touch with that, as we turn in our Bibles to Psalm 121. Psalm 121. <clears throat> We've been in this series for the last several weeks where we're looking at the songs we sing when we find ourselves in certain places, certain states of being. Last week, Brian did such a great job in helping us to unpack what do we do when we find ourselves filled with doubt? What song is it that we find ourselves singing? How do we connect with God in any real way when we have doubt? We looked at how do we connect with God when we're sad, when we're depressed. We don't feel like getting out of bed. What do we do there? How do we connect with God when we're happy, when we're grateful, when we're thankful? How do we connect with God in these places? Today, what I want us to look at is how do we connect with God when we're afraid? How do we connect with God when we're afraid? Now, this psalm, Psalm 121, is a part of 15, a group of 15 psalms called the Psalms of Ascent. The psalms of Ascent. And these were songs that were sung on a journey from pilgrims that were going to Jerusalem to celebrate major festivals like Passover or Pentecost or Tabernacles. And inevitably, as they were traveling from wherever it is that they were coming for their day's journey, they would sing these songs, these 15 songs. Now, when you're making your way from point A to point B, you may well be headed to a place that is good that is good for you, and a, good, a place that is right for you to move towards, but it doesn't necessarily ensure that everything's always going to work out as you want it to. Just because you're on the road to something good doesn't mean that there aren't some things along the way that are going to happen that are bad. And so, as the pilgrims would make their way towards Jerusalem for these festivals to worship God in the temple, they would sing these songs. And this one in particular... Um, deals with the issue on the front end of where do I turn when I'm afraid? And so what I want to do is I want us to just walk through, it's not a very long song, but I want to walk through this and then I just want to make some comments and application as we unpack this, okay? So beginning in verse 1, Psalm 121, the psalmist writes, he says, I look up to the mountains, does my help come from there? Some of your versions will say, where does my help come from? Now, inevitably, as a pilgrim is making their way to Jerusalem, there are lots of hills and even mountains that they will have to traverse. And in that day, the Canaanites would set up all sorts of altars and shrines to their gods, Baal and Ashtoreth, 
so that as they made their way through the hill countries, that they would be provided safe passage. There was a lot of superstition that if you didn't do certain things, make certain sacrifices, that you wouldn't be able to make your way safely through. And it was evil. It was wicked. They would make human sacrifices in these hills and these mountains. And so as the psalmist is getting ready to go on his journey to Jerusalem, he looks up at the hills that he's about to make his way through. And what he says is, as I look to the hills, where does my help come from? Because the only answer isn't the Lord. There are other answers. I want you to think about that. Where does my help come from? Sometimes when we're afraid, we turn into food. We overeat. There are many of us who find comfort in food. When we are afraid, we turn to food. Some of us overindulge in other ways, in alcohol, drugs, other things, right? Some of us, when we're afraid, we isolate ourselves from the very people who can help us have perspective when we most need it. Some of us, when we're afraid, isolate. Some of us just totally disconnect completely. I was doing some research this week, and did you realize that the average person in the United States watches, in a given month, 24 hours, or in a given week, I'm sorry, 24 hours of television. One week, the average person who lives in the United States watches 24 hours of television in one week. Now, in a year's time, that's two months. So two months of your life out of an entire year, the average person spends watching TV. Just because you're checking out, you're so much more invested in other people's lives that you're not really living your own. You know, a lot of us do different things when we are afraid. We turn to different things. And right at the very beginning of the psalm, the psalmist is asking himself, when I survey this journey that I'm about to go on, and I'm moving through these places that maybe are a little bit scary, where am I going to turn for help? And there are more places than just to turn to the Lord. In verse 2, he answers this question, though. He says, my help comes from the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. It doesn't come from haagen It doesn't come from Jack Daniels. It doesn't come from the reality of My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and the earth. So even those who are creating these shrines and these altars in the hills to these other gods, these gods of fertility, these nature gods, he says, my help comes from one who is bigger than And so, right here, right in the earliest stages, we're on a journey, right? I mean, the Psalms of Ascent, they're, they're about people who are going from one place to another. They're making a pilgrimage someplace. We're making a journey. And along our journey, there are going to be times where we are totally afraid. And I just want to ask you as we're getting started, where do you turn when you're totally afraid? What do you do when you're afraid? Now, there's a great shift from verse 2 to verse 3, and then the rest from verses 3 to verses, to verses 8. There's this place where in the first two verses, it's spoken in the I, me, mom. So the guy who's making the trip is actually the one speaking. But it's almost as if in verse 3, there then becomes this course of response a reminder to the person making the trip from those who are not making the trip about what he needs to remember as he's on his way. Listen to verse 3. He will not let you stumble. The one who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel never slumbers or sleeps. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord stands beside you as your protective shade. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon at night. The Lord keeps you from all harm and watches over your life. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and you go, both now and for heaven. As you listen to that, what was the word that keeps popping up in there? There's a word that comes up about five times in six verses. The Lord watches. The Lord, His name, comes up multiple times, but the word that comes up five times in six verses is He watches over you. 
This is the picture of a God who is not remote, nor distant, nor uncaring, nor unkind. This is a personal God, a great God, creator God, but who is intimately in touch with everything that's going on in your life. He will not let you stumble. The one who watches over you will not slumber. He is never sleeping. Prison, 
the Lord was with him. Truthfully, sometimes the gracious hand of God preserves you from the pits of life. And you don't need that. Sometimes God is so actively at work protecting you from stuff you have no idea you almost fell into. But there are some times where God does not, the gracious hand of God does not spare us from great trouble. Sometimes the gracious hand of God preserves us through those troubles. So I think when the psalmist is talking about here where he says the Lord keeps you from all harm, I think there's this place in our soul that God has the capacity to preserve to keep us from becoming bitter and hard and fearful people. What, what are your life circumstances and situations where you find yourself afraid? What are they doing to you right now? Just because you get a spot in your life that's difficult doesn't mean that you have to become difficult. Just because you hit some space in your life where fear is knocking on your door doesn't mean that you have to invite it in and make a home such that you become a different person, such that it begins to harden you and to crush your spirit. This is a story about a person on a journey headed towards doing something right, but along the way it's a spot where something right doesn't happen to them. You get that you can do good things in life and still bad things happen to you, right? You understand that? Oftentimes when I was a kid growing up, I was taught differently. That if I just did the right thing, if I worked hard and kept my nose clean, that things would work out for me. It does not always work like that. It would be nice if it did, but it does not. And so what I want us to ask ourselves as we're moving through our journeys and we hit these places where we become afraid of this, where do we turn most naturally? when we hit that spot of fear. And who is it that we're becoming when we hit this place of fear? Who is it that we are becoming? Because the Lord has an amazing capacity to be with us in those spots to keep us from becoming bitter, cynical, fearful, difficult people. Just because you get a hard spot doesn't mean you have to be So this morning, what I'm wanting you to get at is, there's a song you sing on your journey when you're moving along and you hit a hard spot. <coughs> Where do you turn? You know, if you're watching 24 hours of television a week, that's two months of your life in the other year. You're watching other people live their lives while yours is passing you by. If you're turning to eating or drinking or excess of some kind, what is that call that you're seeing? If you're isolating yourself from the people and the places, from the God who can most help you navigate the place you find yourself with grace, what is it that that's doing to your soul? The idea is not just to get through, but to get through it with such grace and dignity that we mirror and model the one who made us and the one who saved and redeemed us. We should, by all means, be becoming more like Christ along our journey, not less like Christ. We start this journey with high expectations that Christ, who comes to save us, to forgive our sins, to redeem us, we love that part. We love that forgiveness of sin part. We love that part about redemption and hope. But somewhere along the way, a year in, two years in, three years in, five years in, we lose sight of what it is that we're heading towards. And what it is that we're heading towards is a, a life lived in such a way where we mirror image that of the one who has saved us. We are to become like Christ, not just to get through. The 
so this morning, when confronted with the things that so trouble us, I just want to keep asking you this question that I want you to take home with you. What song are you singing when you hit this spot where you're totally, completely unnerved? <coughs> that spot where you think, I'm going to be alone for the rest of my life. I am so desperately lonely. That spot where you hit and you can say to yourself, I don't know how I'm going to pay the bills at the end of this month. I don't know how I'm going to make it. That spot where you hit, where you just say, I don't know if my kid's going to make it. I'm so scared for their well-being. That spot where you hit, where you've started to do things that you know aren't right. Your response to the situation, you know they're not a right response, but you can't help yourself. Now you're on a track. And you're headed in a direction that's not leading you to life, it's leading you to death. Why? We numb ourselves. We distract ourselves. We busy ourselves when we get afraid. And I'm just suggesting simply, maybe, maybe, we should sing a different song. I look to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. The one who is great, but who cares so intimately for me that he's watching over me day and night, making sure as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death that I'm not alone. <clears throat> making sure that as I walk through the hard places of life, that fear doesn't become my Lord. Because once you let fear in, fear is amazingly fearful in its ability to guide and lead your life. Isn't it? There is no place in the life of one who follows the Christ for fear to be your Lord. And the psalm that you need to be singing as you think about your person who plays your at is one of opening to God, not closing to God. It's one of opening up, not turning in. It's one of moving forward, not turning back. And that whole thing about won't let harm come to you, I think that has a lot more to do with the state of one's soul than it does anything else. Sometimes when harm comes our way, we shake our fists and we get angry with God. And there's a place for that too. We'll talk about that next week. As if somehow we should have just navigated life and nothing bad should have ever happened to us. I don't know what world you are living in to have the expectation that you will move through life without ever having anything bad come your way, but it is an unrealistic world if that is your expectation. And I have found, simply, <clears throat> that if I right-size my expectations, it leads me to a place where I'm better able to handle the stuff that comes my way. I shouldn't be surprised when at this turn or that turn in my life that it isn't all <clears throat> together. <clears throat> It isn't all working in my favor. That it isn't all good all the time. Sometimes bad things happen. And when those bad things happen, what song are you singing? Where are you turning? What are you doing? I want you to think about that. It's an open-ended question. But it's one I hope you'll give serious consideration to. The psalmist says, when I look to the hills, when I look out in front of me, when I look at the journey before me, I turn my eyes to the maker of heaven and earth, the one who made me, the one who saved me, the one who will sustain me, and I trust in him, no matter what. No matter what. Let's pray.
there are real, real places that we find ourselves in today, Lord. And when we walk out of this building, we will be confronted with those realities that have driven us to places of dread and fear. But the choice we have is to how we will respond to that as we move forward. And I pray this day that this song would be a song that we would come to sing because we realize that even when things don't work out, that God, you are still watching over and caring for and providing for our needs in ways that would surprise and even stun us. I pray that we would learn to turn to you, that there would be a growing level of trust God, that as we surrender our daily control, that we would lean on that which saves us, heals us.